Okay, hello and welcome to another Rush Generations Health Education Lecture. Um, our Rush Generations is delighted to be your source of information, resources, and health promotion programs that help maximize your well being and good health as you age. Today is Wednesday, August 9, 2023, and I am Grisel Rodriguez. Morales, Rush Generations Program Director. I'll be your moderator for today's lecture, um, where we will be discussing our God. We must listen to our God. We all know the proverbial saying, you are what you eat, which means that it is very important to eat well in order to be healthy. As we said in the, in the summer edition of our quarterly newsletter, the gut has often been called our body's second brain. So we are delighted to have two of our Rush colleagues speak about how important it is to listen to our gut, especially about that connection between gut health and our overall health and that brain uh, um, gut connection. Um, before I introduce the wonderful speaker joining us today, I'd like to first thank Anna Weitzman, always helping with the production of this lecture, and she will be helping us manage the chat in our YouTube channel and other key aspects so that we all can have a great discussion during this lecture. As always, we are live streaming this lecture via our Rush Generations YouTube channel, where we have dozens of other health education lectures that you will always can refer back to or send to friends, families, colleagues um, that could also benefit from this information. We use the video platform Zoom, which also allow us to host a good number of people who join us, join us via phone. Um, thank you so much for joining us. For those of you on YouTube, we ask that you please use the chat function to ask questions, and or to add to the discussion throughout the lecture. We will make sure that the comments uh, and questions that you submit make it to our presenters. And for those of you listening to the discussion via phone, as always, you will also have an opportunity at the end to unmute your audio so that you can ask your questions. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, let me introduce our speakers. Actually, we'd like to remind you that all the information offered here is for general informational purposes to, and to always seek additional professional advice for situations specific to your, and your health and your needs. Okay, so today we'll have with us um, first present Dr. Pooja Agarwal. She is a nutritionist, and nutritional epidemiologist at the Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center. We have collaborated with them for years and years um, here at a Rush University Medical Center. Her research focuses on the role of modifiable lifestyle factors in healthy aging, primarily focusing on the relationship of diet, including dietary patterns, specific food groups, food groups and nutrients, um, especially antioxidants and metals, with cognitive and motor decline in diverse older adults. Her current research work is funded by the National Institute of Health and Alzheimer's Association Grant Award. Great to have you. Then we'll, list, we'll hear from Stacy Davis. Stacy is a recent graduate from Rush University's Bachelor of Programs in Health Sciences and is currently working as an Associate Clinical Research Coordinator in the Division of Movement Disorders here at Rush University Medical Center. Many of the studies that Stacy is tasked with involve improving diversity, equity, and inclusion among minority populations in Parkinson's disease research. Pertaining to today's lecture, Stacy has been tasked with a study regarding the gut-brain axis, which is the goal of gaining a better understanding of why and how people with Parkinson's disease um, and REM sleep behavioral disorder have 
a common issue of poor gut health and how the gut and the brain are connected. So delighted that both of you are here, delighted that we have a good number of people in uh, joining us today. So without further ado, let's see, we'll have Dr. Agarwal uh, pull up her slides. Anna, if you could help with that, that'd be great. Oh, interestingly, do we have a Dr. Agarwal with us? Uh, she's joining right now. Apparently she got hit off Zoom, no worries. She's back with us. So let's see, these things happen, but it's a wonderful thing that we can just meet with all of you virtually. <laughs> Okay, let's see if Dr. Agarwal can. Yes, hear I am you. here. Excellent, thank you so much. I'm so sorry, I think, no I don't know. Problem. We just uh, we just finished the intro. So um, Hannah has your slides ready for you. Um, would you like us to advance? Just let uh, her know. Please. Yes, please. Thank you so much. Uh, so hurry, hello, everybody. Uh, I, my name is uh, Pooja Agarwal, uh, and primarily I'm going to talk about two uh, things today. So the first uh, piece is about the gut microbiota and gut flora. Um, and that second piece is, uh, as mentioned before, about the mind diet and its effect on health. So I'm starting with the first piece, which is gut microbiota. Uh, if you can advance the slide, please. Uh, so we are going to talk about three main um, things, like what is gut microbiota? It's interchangeably also you um, called as gut microbiome or gut flora, and what does it mean? And then why is gut flora important? And then we will uh, briefly see what are different things or factors that can affect your gut flora. Next slide, please. Uh, now coming on to the first one, what is gut microbiota? So gut microbiota is, or gut microbiome or flora, I'll use these terms interchangeably. There are microorganisms uh, that include bacteria, fungi, viruses that live in our digestive tract. So, so they are present in the animal body. And so I'm particularly talking about the human body. So it, they're very much present and they're almost 10 times in population, the microbial cell in our digestive tract compared to any other human body um, uh, or, or organ or any, any other place. So it, it, is, it does play an important role in our overall health. Now, next we will see that, uh, next slide please. Uh, how it is important. And then in our next slide, we will, uh, we have like a list of things that gut flora is doing. So gut flora or gut microbiota is very much important because these bacteria help uh, to harvest an energy from the food. They're very important in the digestive tract, help in uh, absorption, digestion, and then uh, various nutrient uh, metabolism metabolism, et cetera. And this gut, gut flora also help to balance the good and the bad uh, bacterial composition. So in our gut, we have some good bacteria, which are very much required for the health. And then there are also development of some bad bacteria, which is not very much required. So, so overall the flora present also help to maintain this balance. The gut flora is very critical for the metabolic functions and it has been linked to different uh, diseases. And I'll uh, do, I will talk about that in the next few slides. What are these, the prominent ones? And then there's always this talk about the diversity of gut flora. So here, um, as we saw in the previous slide, the gut includes different organisms. So there, there's variety of microorganisms and the diverse of these microorganisms makes your gut more healthy, we can say. So the diversity of gut flora is very important for health and diversity of gut flora may vary because of different factors like environmental factor, your diet, your eating pattern, body weight, or sometimes pre-existing conditions also. 
So the next piece we are talking about is how gut microbiota or flora is also important and linked with the neurodegenerative disorders of aging. So um, there has been this evolving concept over the number of years, a number of years of research has found that there is a connection between gut and brain. So we call it a gut brain access. Um, there are any, any kind of disbalance in the gut, which is also termed as gut dysbiosis. Um, it does affect different parts of the brain in different ways. And some of the things that can affect, uh, it can, can be affected by this gut dysbiosis is our appetite or our pain, pain perception. Uh, there are also now new studies that can affect your mood, anxiety, etc. But my area of research is more focused on um, the Alzheimer's disease, the Parkinson's, and overall neurodegenerative disorders. I've like read more on, on that space, and uh, there there is compelling evidence now that and the the gut dysbiosis or the imbalance of the good and the bad uh, microbiota in our gut is also linked with the cognitive function and the motor function in older adults. And definitely what we eat affects our gut. And then um, I will talk about what we should eat when I talk about the mind diet. But the third factor here uh, we are going to talk about is uh, all these different things that can affect your gut flora. So um, coming on to the next slide, here is a picture on like what all can really affect your gut and your microorganisms in, living in your gut. So definitely diet plays a role, but then uh, there's also evidence that it can change over time with age. Uh, stress uh, is definitely that can affect your gut flora. Other than that, other um, things that can affect is the any kind of infection like other pathogens. Uh, exercise has also been shown um, to have uh, an positive impact on the gut. And then we have some medications that can definitely impact your gut flora. So, so definitely there's some, it, this is a, um, a thing that's not just affected by just only by what you eat or like uh, your other family history or other things, but there are like a lot of environmental factors along uh, that plays a role in maintaining a good gut health, which is really important for overall health. Now, uh, coming on to our next slide, um, we here just represent how different food and gut health is related. So uh, I'm sure all of you have heard about the terms prebiotics and probiotics. So, so when we say like probiotics, the food already has some microorganisms, the living organisms in them that helps our gut to have a good uh, gut flora. And then there are prebiotics, like all these foods with a lot of fibers and the nutrients, which are very much essential to maintain our gut health. So here in this picture, as you can see there, the yellow um, circle has all these healthy food items, all the foods and the vegetables and uh, different fiber. Like these foods are rich in a lot of nutrients, which are very much required um, for overall health, but also for the gut health, because these are phytochemicals, these are polyphenols, flavonoids with fiber and other pigments, which actually get metabolized and absorbed and overall help the gut in a way that it benefits the microbes. It um, increases the diversity of the gut uh, flora, and then it also helps the overall um, gut dysbiosis by rescuing any kind of disbalance that's happening. And uh, it has been shown over by a different number of uh, researchers across the globe that all this um, different uh, prebiotics and the probiotic, I'm, I'm not showing any probiotic right now here, but then there is evidence that there are different uh, uh, foods that can affect your gut health and overall gut health is really much related to your um, the, um, gastrointestinal diseases. It helps to promote brain function. Uh, we do have evidence of how gut health uh, health can improve your immune function and also overall help um, with obesity or diabetes or other vascular risk factors. So with that, I will just sum up the gut health here. And then uh, considering how food can affect gut, we are going to talk about our next piece, which is the mind diet. So in this piece, I'm 
bringing up like generally um, the mind diet, cognitive function, and its effect on overall health outcomes, primarily among older adults. And what we know so far from the scientific research that has been done. Um, so most of the research I'm talking about is being done here at Rush, uh, but I'll bring in the other pieces as well. So coming on to our next slide, um, there is this agenda where I'll briefly talk about what is the mind diet, uh, what are the different foods that are part of the mind diet, uh, some important nutrients for your brain health, and how certain uh, foods are part of the mind diet can help your brain, and how mind diet can otherwise overall uh, help the health of an individual. So coming up to the last slide, I'll start with what is mind diet. So I'm not sure uh, how many of you know about this here, but I'll just start with that mind diet is a hybrid of uh, two diets, which are well uh, known and characterized in when research. Uh, it's a combination of Mediterranean and the DASH diet. And the acronym MIND, MIND, stands for Mediterranean DASH Intervention for Neurodegenerative Delay. And this was the diet created uh, here at Rush uh, by Dr. Martha Claire Morris and her colleagues. And I had an opportunity to work as her, um, as her postdoctoral fellow. And uh, this was a diet specially established to uh, prevent the neurodegenerative de uh, disorders and delaying the progressions. And uh, this particular diet, as you can see in the uh, picture or the figure posted next to the text, uh, it says like specific amount recommended. Uh, most of these recommendations are based on the scientific evidence behind these foods and what we know so far from the human studies, from the animal studies, and uh, also using our uh, data we have from older adults. So mind diet here uh, includes foods that are known to maintain and improve brain health. And when I say brain health, there are different measures uh, using the cognitive measures, motor outcomes, et cetera. And then mind diet overall includes 10 healthy items and five unhealthy food groups, which one should avoid. So you can see in the picture, there are recommended foods on the top, like the whole grains, uh, green leafy berries, fruits and vegetables overall poultry, uh, fish, legumes. Uh, however, there is also recommendation on limiting the high fat, high sugar foods, including pastries and sweets, uh, full fat cheese, margarine and butter. So coming up to the next slide uh, is more uh, details and the, on different foods that are part of my diet. And going on to the next one, we will see here what are the healthy food groups which are included in the mind diet. So the foods included are whole grain, green leafy vegetables. Again, we have evidence on how green leafy vegetables are uh, good for the brain and it has all the different vitamins and uh, minerals and bioactives required to help that are required for the brain health and its maintenance. Uh, other vegetables, um, when I say veg other vegetables, it includes all kinds of vegetables, uh, colorful vegetables, uh, then berries, uh, any kind of berries, uh, nuts, poultry, beans, and legumes. Uh, beans and legumes can be like uh, any kind of beans or legumes, or for example, hummus or some other uh, food made out of beans and legumes, uh, fish and olive oil. And then uh, we go on to the unhealthy food items in the next slide, which is um, uh, the foods that, which one should avoid. So that's definitely the food which is high in sugar, high in fat, uh, and that includes butter or margarine. We, you, you should limit these foods. Uh, then the full fat cheese, the fried food, the red and the processed meats, uh, as well as pastries and sweets. So uh, on the next slide uh, now, I have like the overall summary of the recommendations we have for the MIND diet. Uh, and the recommendation is that you should focus more on the whole grain consumption, so at least two servings per day. <clears throat> Green leafy of one or more servings per day. Uh, definitely vegetables should be included uh, such that you're having one or more servings per day. The berries can be uh, almost like five half cup servings per week, uh, legumes three or more servings per week, and nuts 
uh, almost like an ounce or a, a one eighth of a cup per week per day. Uh, fish, uh, there is a supporting literature from our group and a lot of other groups around the globe that consuming at least one serving of fish is good enough uh, for your brain health. So that's the recommendation followed for the mind uh, diet. Uh, poultry, two or more servings per week, again, to also decrease the red or processed meat consumption is important aspect, which is consuming less than four servings of this red meat or processed meat. And then uh, limiting your fried food for less than once a week. And the pastries and the sweet food less than five times a week. Consuming cheese less uh, so as uh, you're limiting yourself to one or less time per day. And again, the butter in the oil in moderation, the butter being just one teaspoon, the small one, or one pat or less uh, in a day. And then olive oil of one or two tablespoons per day. Olive oil is something which has been reported to have good impact on brain health because of the polyphenol content, et cetera. So now moving on, after reading the recommendations, we are moving on on some of the examples I've selected for a few of the foods here. So for example, when we are talking about green leafy, how can you incorporate those in your diet? So it's recommended that you want to have one or more servings per day. So including uh, any kind of dark green in your salad is an option. For example, kale, card, uh, arugula, you can go with mustard um, leaves or cooked greens on the side. You can add greens in your soup or in your curries. Uh, and then the second very important component of the mind diet is berries. Again, this has uh, been a lot of scientific research on uh, the polyphenols in the bioactive present in the berries. Uh, and how they are good for your brain. So you can include any kind of berries as a midday snack, add them to your cereals or salads, uh, or on a whole grain toast, uh, or in a low fat yogurt parfait with granola. I mean, definitely I'm not adding a shot, uh, like a strawberry shortcake is not added as a berry here. Uh, the actual fruit is something which one needs to consume, or you can go with the frozen berry options or dried berry options too. Then we have fish and seafood, another very important component, which has a good fat in it, very much required for your brain. And uh, the way you can consume it is in the grilled baked options. You can infuse it with spices and condiments, which again, help you to uh, provide a lot of nutrients uh, required for your brain health. Next slide, please. The third piece of... Uh, uh, the talk today is um, of the mind diet talk is uh, the important nutrients which uh, are there as part of um, the diet, which are very much required for your brain health. Uh, now, next slide, please. Uh, when we see uh, what all nutrients are important, this is like years and years of research done across the globe. They're, they're on the uh, left-hand side, you'll see a nutrient list. Uh, I'm sure you must have heard of about these nutrients like vitamin E, omega-3, uh, DPA and EHA are two forms of omega-3, which are important for brain. And then B vitamins, uh, certain kinds of fats, like saturated fats. Um, then carotenoids are another component. These, are, the, these have antioxidant properties uh, and they are present in all the colorful foods and vegetables. Um, there is research done uh, with flavonoids, the bioactive in the food, the vitamin D, uh, trans fat, again, which is not good for you, the monounsaturated fats, the polyphenols, and other bioactives. So overall, this list summarizes what we definitely know for sure is helping our brain in different ways. It helps with memory, it helps with overall executive function, working memory, and there have been different studies um, in different uh, uh, like in humans or in animals, but, uh, and also with the longitudinal follow-up studies where uh, people have followed older adults for a longer period of time and looked at if there are associations between these nutrients and the brain health outcomes, such as cognition or motor function. So we definitely know that this list of nutrient does help our brain health overall. And there are certain foods which are, rich in these nutrients. So going back onto the food sources, which are on the right side, when I say vitamin E, it's very much present in the nuts and the oils and 
uh, green leafies and whole grains and uh, omega-3 very much present in fish and like other seeds also. Uh, B vitamins and vegetables, uh, consuming less saturated fat is one of the important component of a uh, healthy diet. And we know that a lot of commercial baked products in the red meat uh, do consume a lot of saturated fat. Uh, then coming on to the other antioxidant uh, nutrients, which have a very important role to play again, uh, is carotenoids, um, which are in colorful green uh, fruits and vegetables I mentioned earlier. Then there are a lot of polyphenols and flavonoids and tea, chocolate berries, um, and other fruits and vegetables also. Uh, and then the monounsaturated fat is something which is good for you. Uh, and it's present in olive oil. And we do have moderate evidence on how olive oil can help the brain health. So overall, this list gives you a summary of why we are saying like these foods are important, what are the nutrients these foods are contributing to, and uh, why we should definitely focus on these particular uh, food products, like food groups, uh, when we're considering to put a plate together to eat. So next slide, please. Um, in the next slide, I will briefly also talk about the fats, because um, there is a lot of uh, misconception about fat, like every fat is bad, but that's not true. We do have a good fat and a bad fat. So the good fat here is omega-3, which I just talked about previously, is very much present in fish. And uh, another good fat we have is the monounsaturated fatty acids. The monounsaturated fat is present in olive oil that helps cognition. The bad fat on the other hand are those which, uh, are like saturated fats and the trans fats, uh, which are a lot of times present in the baked foods, um, which are commercially available most of the time, and are associated with poor cognition. Uh, and overall high ratio of saturated to unsaturated fats increases LDL and uh, also decreases the good cholesterol, which is LDL cholesterol in our body. So, and there are like a lot of other vascular risk factors associated with fats uh, also. And we do have animal uh, studies indicating that uh, the mice who were put on high saturated fat in a cholesterol diet had impaired memory and also had more deposits of the amyloid beta, the particular hallmark of Alzheimer's disease in the brain. So overall, we do have uh, enough compelling evidence um, for uh, recommending less of saturated fat and then recommending more of omega-3 fatty acids to uh, maintain our brain health. Next slide, please. Uh, so coming on to another important good fat, uh, omega-3, why is that important? So I'm, I'm also calling fish and the same, putting fish in the same category because again, it's an, a very good source of omega-3 fat, but so are other seeds for those who are vegetarians. Uh, the, the, there are other sources uh, of omega-3, but the omega-3s are called as good fat. Um, so why is it good fat? And it's also often called as brain food because 50 to 60% of our brain is lipid, is fat. So, so it is very important for our brain function, such as maintaining brain cells and its connectivity. It is important to have this good fat in your diet. So consuming a non-fried fish uh, is a very important aspect to maintain your brain health. Next slide, please. Uh, then another important nutrient I talked uh, in the list was carotenoids, and this is now some evidence we have from our studies done here at Rush. Uh, we, what we found, so in, our, in Rush, we do um, multiple studies uh, for older adults, and what we are doing is we uh, have enrolled these participants when they were 65, and then we are following them over long period of time and they they are um we are assessing them clinically and uh they also do donate their brains at the time of death so so the, this most of these uh findings i'm telling you today is either um from like either or from the longitudinal studies we have done so far uh from uh, memory and aging project or chicago health and aging project so what we found overall, people who are consuming more of these um, nutrients, the carotenoids, which are the naturally occurring pigment, the colored pigment we have in fruits and vegetables, it can be red, yellow, orange, dark green fruits and vegetables. 
the people who are consuming more of these uh, had almost 47% reduced risk of Alzheimer's disease, dementia, when we compared to those who were consuming less uh, or uh, almost no, um, none of these like fruits and vegetables in their diet. Uh, overall, consuming one to two servings of green leafy vegetables daily um, were almost equivalent to being 11 years younger, which is a huge uh, difference we found when we compared it with the, the individuals who were not eating it or were eating it very rarely. When I say rarely, it's like almost once a month. Um, so, uh, so we did find that eat, in our population, in our study population, that uh, older adults who were consuming one to two servings of green leafy vegetables performed better in their cognitive tests over time. And uh, their performance were almost equivalent to being uh, 11 years younger. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, similarly, we did uh, this kind of study with other foods too. And the next one I'm talking about is the polyphenol of flavonoid subclass, which is called pelargonidin. Now, this is uh, one of the primary polyphenols present in berries, and we did assess its association with the Alzheimer's dementia risk in the same population. And it did find that people who were consuming more pelargonidin, this primary polyphenol found in berry, had almost 35% reduced risk of Alzheimer's dementia. And overall, we also recently found that the, the higher berry intake uh, was associated with less risk of Alzheimer's dementia in this population. So those who were consuming berries at least uh, more than one or two times a week had lesser uh, risk uh, of having or developing Alzheimer's dementia in the follow-up. Next slide, please. So after talking about like these different foods and nutrients, I just want to summarize uh, by saying that all the foods which are recommended in the MIND diet have all these important nutrients, uh, different nutrients and bioactive also actually, which are important for brain health. So we have carotenoids, we have vitamin E, these foods are rich in vitamin C also, the B vitamins, the polyphenols, the omega-3. So vitamin E, C, uh, and carotenoids are also the antioxidant vitam um, vitamins are also antioxidant nutrients, or you can say that, which help to fight uh, the free radicals. And then again, have like hold together an important uh, function in our overall health. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, before going any further, talking about the foods, I also want to share my thoughts on the supplement to use. And again, this is just my thoughts. Uh, definitely, uh, people may have different ones, but this is what I think based on the research, which I've read so far and the studies done um, so far in our group and others. Most of the studies do not show a direct effect of the supplement use on cognitive function. However, we recently had a publication in this year where uh, the supplement trial uh, was done, where a randomized control trial was done and the supplement use uh, had some effect on the memory function. Uh, but overall, in our studies, the studies which I've mentioned before, um, the nutrients, uh, we, we did look at the nutrients consumed from the food sources and from the supplements, but we always found that the association of the nutrients coming from food sources uh, is significant uh, with any kind of brain health outcomes. However, the supplements were not. Um, again, it can have different reasons why it's happening, because when you consume any nutrient through food, it's absorbed differently. There is interactions of nutrients, there's fiber, there's so many other things versus when you consume any nutrient or any supplement, it's a different form sometimes, and then it's absorbed differently. But I would say definitely ask your doctor uh, about the supplement to use if you want to start any, if you want to continue anything or if you, I mean, definitely if your blood work shows a deficiency, you certainly do need a nutrient, which is very, very important. Uh, but try to get your nutrients from the um, fresh food itself, like from fruits and vegetables, et cetera. I mean, that's my one cent for um, the overall supplement use. Uh, next slide, please. Now, coming in the next piece, which is how the mind diet is good for your brain. I did talk about that in previous slide, but I would to, like to 
further um, talk about uh, some important things uh, we have done so far. The next slide, please. Um, so did you know that in our study, we found that those who were following the MIND diet, the overall uh, diet, which I just showed in a couple of slides back, which included more uh, whole grain, more fruits, and uh, not just any fruit, like more berries, more greens, more vegetables, uh, fish, poultry, olive oil, um, and then less of the other unhealthy food groups, those five unhealthy food groups. So we, we categorized our study population into having a high mind diet group versus low. And we did find that the uh, older adults who were consuming uh, a, di a mind diet uh, had almost 35 to 50% reduced risk of Alzheimer's dementia during their follow-up. Uh, we also found that the improvement in people's diet in just one area, uh, such as uh, increasing just your leafy green consumption to six servings per week, or just adding one more fish serving in your diet, which is not non-fried serving, was associated with fewer amyloid plaques in the brain, uh, which were almost equal to being like four years younger. Uh, so, I mean, because the, whenever these older adults are dying, these are these are the studies which uh, started in the 90s, uh, one of them in early 90s, and then the other one on, in uh, 98. So, so we have followed quite a lot of people over a lot of number of years, and we do have a lot of uh, evidence uh, supporting these uh, and also have brains from them to uh, confirm these findings. Uh, and I, I thought this is like very interesting finding given that um, we do not unfortunately have a perfect cure for Alzheimer's disease or Alzheimer's dementia. And one of the ways to uh, have a healthy aging is to have uh, have a good cognition, have a good memory in your later age. And if doing such a simple um, lifestyle modifications, such as in, uh, improving your diet in one or two aspects or overall improving your diet, uh, uh, matching the mind diet sc uh, score or have, consuming more fruits and vegetables, et cetera, can reduce your risk for Alzheimer's dementia. It can um, probably have like a huge public health impact um, in the aging population. Next slide, please. So overall, uh, we did see, uh, again, using the same study, we did look at other outcomes as well. Um, the studies done at Rush also do assess different clinical outcomes. So we do assess their Parkinsonian signs uh, or, uh, and um, overall the motor function or, or functional disability. So we did find that people who are consuming better uh, diet primarily looking at mind diet score here had a slower progression of Parkinsonian signs uh, another group um, from Canada found that people uh, on the MIND diet had reduced risk of Parkinson's disease. Uh, then we do uh, also have another study from Harvard, uh, which identified that MIND diet uh, was associated with better motor function. Uh, in our cohort at Rush, we found that MIND diet was also associated with less functional disability risk in older adults, and as well as fewer depressive symptoms. Next slide, please. Uh, and with that, I come on to almost the end of our um, presentation, which is uh, how the mind diet can help our overall health. So um, next slide, please. When I say uh, any kind of diet, um, or, or I think whenever you go and listen about um, the healthy diets, the healthy diet should be a, a, an umbrella term. I am using mind diet as uh, one of these um, markers for the healthy diet. It's basically a dietary pattern. It's a combination of certain fruits and vegetables. It can be very much similar to existing diets. Uh, and mind diet is similar to existing Mediterranean or DASH diet because it's a hybrid of both these diets. But then when we are talking about any kind of healthy diet, it's not just helping our brain, it also helps our heart and it's, it helps our overall well-being. So healthy diets are relatable and they, they, they are related not only to just the brain health, but they're all, are also with the healthier heart. Uh, as per the EHA, the American Heart Association guidelines, um, they're very much similar. So 
you have you should be consuming more fruits and vegetables there's more whole grains and overall less of red meat etc healthy diets and older adults not only just help um, the heart and the brain they also help to maintain the body weight so which is very important when you get old you shouldn't be like losing a lot of a uh, lot of weight and then you should be maintaining your weight which is uh, like maintaining your muscle mass is very important so having a a proper protein source in your diet is essential. Then it also helps with uh, when your muscle mass is maintained and your motor activities overall is also better. Uh, so we do know that overall healthy diet also helps with anxiety and depressive symptoms. So the whole idea is when you are eating healthier, it's not just for your brain or your heart, it's, it's for your overall health. Uh, that's a very possible uh, lifestyle modification that one can adapt for um, for overall healthy well-being. Next slide, please. Uh, and what? Just going on the recap on what we learned today. We just went over what is gut microbiota. Sorry, there is a typo here. But then I wanted to say that gut um, flora is a diverse microorganism present in the digestive tract. And now we know that mind diet is designed as a dietary approach to delay neurodegenerative disorders. It uh, not only helps your brain, but it does help your overall health. There are different foods that are part of the mind diet and that can be easily incorporated in your daily routine, such as uh, different vegetables, green leafies, berries, nuts, um, legumes, uh, poultry, fish, et cetera. And there are different foods which can be easily avoided which are high fat, high sugar foods, uh, which are definitely not good for your um, health and should be limited. Uh, with that, I think the next slide I have is, can you, uh, I just want to, uh, uh, before ending up, want to say that healthy meals help. Uh, they do help in your overall well-being. Uh, I would say. So it's very important that you talk to your dietitians, talk to your nutritionists, or um, ask your doctor or ask your doctor to connect you with the nutritionists or the dietitians and their team so that whenever you have any questions uh, on what you should eat or how you should eat, you should go back and ask them. Um, do not hesitate to ask uh, and try to to not like go over for the fat diets. Like there are a lot of literature <clears throat> limited uh, on like different fat diets. So try to eat um, a healthy, uh, healthier options and go for the nutrient rich foods, uh, which can primarily definitely help your, um, not only the brain, the heart and the overall well-being. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay, so that's the that was my last slide. And with that, uh, I would like to thank you all for listening. If you have any further questions, please be in touch. Uh, you can email me or email Rush Generations or uh, and they can ask me or forward your questions. But I'm looking forward to any kind of questions here on the chat. With that, I will stop and thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Agarwal. Um, I mean, not only for starting off us with this information about the gut microbiome um, and the mind diet, but also making sure that people understood, you know, that if we neglect our gut, then we don't we don't only experience, you know, the normal what people think about is the the bloating, the abdominal pain, constipation but the, the, that it can also affect our mood. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. our sleep um, and even our cognitive function, something very important to keep in mind. So we're gonna have mm -hmm. then have, um, well, there's one question I would like to do, to have to pose bes beside, uh, before Stacy join us. And I okay. think you got to this answer when you were presenting about indeed that uh, important research uh, about the man diet and how it had such a high percentage, 35 to 50% of reduction of risk of developing any condition. But the mm -hmm. person writes that it's, you know, you mentioned that it's associated with better memory, focus, and thinking skill, skills. How helpful is the diet for people that have already been diagnosed with vascular dementia or mm -hmm. any cognitive issue? 
Yes, uh, that's a very interesting question. And I would say like there are ongoing studies. So what I presented here were people who didn't have that and then developed it over time. So that's what we did in our study. But there are studies ongoing for the same thing, like identifying if uh, diet can help uh, mm -hmm. people with mild cognitive impairment or people with vascular dementias, et cetera. So I think we should have some answer, some answers soon. But uh, apart from like the scientific thing or any evidence, I would say it should help. That's my hypothesis that uh, any kind of healthy diet should help even the vascular dementias, uh, given that a diet is also helping your vascular outcomes. Um, like it helps your blood pressure, it helps your diabetes that again, impacts your vas uh, risk for vascular dementia. So, um, but yeah, I think we still need more evidence on uh, the well, scientific uh, yeah. results on this. Yeah. Fascinating. How can, how resilient we are. So even if there's some damage, we can still repair. Yes. 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 Fascinating. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. So we'll thank have you. then now um, Stacy Davis. Um, Stacy, Stacy, if you would like to pull up your slides. Sure. Excellent. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. The screen is yours. I used to say the floor okay. is yours, but now it's the screen. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just to reintroduce myself, uh, my name is Stacy Davis, and I'm one of the um, associate clinical research coordinators um, here at Rush in the Division of Movement Disorders. Um, and I just wanted to give an overview for those who may not be familiar um, that movement disorders is a category of neurology um, that involves various neurological conditions that may cause um, increased, slowed, or decreased movements, um, Parkinson's disease being one of the more common ones. Um, and I just wanted to give a little bit of overview about Parkinson's disease as, and REM sleep behavior disorder and what that has to do with um, the gut-brain connection um, and what studies that we're doing um, in this department on this topic. Um, so um, just a little overview um, as far as what is Parkinson's disease. It's a disease that tends to occur um, you know, later in life, um, mostly associated with tremors, uh, balance problems, and some memory decline, um, the loss of dopaminergic neurons and um, alpha-synuclein aggregates um, in the brain are one of the more pathological ha hallmarks of the disease. Um, but we're still trying to understand you know, the exact causes of where it comes from. Um, it's not related to genetics. Um, and one of the main things is that oxidative stress and inflammation um, is thought to be critical for the alpha-synuclein aggregation and that dopamine loss. Um, and one of the cells in the brain, uh, one of the types that's thought to be the primary source of this inflammation is called the microglia. Um, and once those are activated, um, they tend to produce oxidative stress and inflammation to protect the brain, but under certain conditions, um, they can become chronically activated and then produce more excessive or um, oxidative stress and inflammation that can cause aggregation of the alpha-synuclein and therefore damage the neurons. Um, and then an overview on the REM sleep behavioral disorder or um, shortened to RBD, um, it is rapid eye movement or REM sleep behavior disorder. Um, and it's a sleep disorder in which you will physically act out um, your visit, vivid and often unpleasant dreams. Um, that might be vocal sounds or violent arm and leg movements, um, basically dream enacting behavior. Um, and what this has to do in relation to uh, Parkinson's disease is that it's been said that REM sleep behavior disorder may be associated with other neurological conditions such as Lewy body dementia, um, Parkinson's disease, or multiple system atrophy. Um, so again, the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease are the consequence of the loss of those dopaminergic neurons. And those motor symptoms emerge when about 70% of those dopamine containing neurons are already lost. Um, and while PD takes uh, a few years to kind of, or decades even, to really fully present itself, um, this is known as something called prodromal Parkinson's disease in which patients uh, or people don't really 
fulfill the full diagnostic criteria, um, but they're still exhibiting some signs and symptoms that indicate that uh, more than likely they'll be developing Parkinson's disease in the future. Um, some of the more cardinal symptoms of prodromal Parkinson's disease uh, might include um, people experiencing things like constipation, loss of smell, um, or REM sleep behavior disorder. Um, and these patients with REM sleep behavioral disorder uh, tend to have very high risk of developing Parkinson's disease over the next one to two uh, decades um, of developing that disorder. And so what we're trying to do is better understand the mechanism of dopamine loss um, that's required to try to design interventions that prevent or delay the onset of Parkinson's disease in patients who have those prodromal symptoms like the constipation and the loss of smell um, and those who have REM sleep behavior disorder. Um, so kind of going into the topic of today, what's the connection uh, between the gut and the brain? Research has shown um, that microorganisms in the human intestine and oral cavity um, called microbiomes uh, can contribute to the pathogenesis of neurological disorders such as Alzheimer's disease, which was mentioned earlier, um, multiple sclerosis, and of course, uh, Parkinson's disease. And um, within our movement disorder and GI groups, um, some researchers have conducted various studies that have shown that patients who have Parkinson's disease have abnormal intestine and nasal oral microbiome um, and endotoxemia, which um, is referring to bacterial products in the blood, um, which is a result of intestinal barrier dysfunction um, or like leaky gut syndrome, if you all are familiar with um, that term. But some of this data demonstrates that an abnormal microbiome and bacterial products in the blood are sufficient to trigger this microglia activation that I mentioned earlier, and that um, excessive oxidative stress and therefore neural inflammation, um, you know, once those toxins from the gut microbiota travel through the bloodstream into the brain. And prodromal Parkinson's disease is associated with that abnormal gut microbiome, which is similar to what has been observed in um, typical Parkinson's disease patients. And so some of the more recent studies have suggested that Parkinson's patients develop um, motor symptoms first, and then a subset of these patients may start to develop the non-motor symptoms that I mentioned earlier, like the constipation, the loss of smell, um, and the rapid eye movement or REM behavioral disorders. Um, and in contrast, other Parkinson's patients, um, they might initially have those non-motor symptoms and then later develop um, the um, symptoms, from mo the motor symptoms related to Parkinson's disease, even if that's decades and years later. Um, and I have here um, just a little diagram picture. Um, I won't go too much into it, but basically talking about um, where these toxins are coming from, how they're traveling through the bloodstream, and ultimately, um, to our understanding, may be um, contributing to um, Parkinson's disease. So um, kind of honing in on the importance of research regarding gut-brain health, um, the microbi microbiome-directed interventions um, could be more impactful as given during this prodromal phase, you know, before patients are essentially overcompensating for the loss of those dopaminergic neurons. Um, and interventions directed towards the microbiome um, have the promise to be a disease-modifying therapeutic intervention by preventing that microglial activation and that neural inflammation. Um, while the trigger and underlying mechanisms for the microglia activation remains to, you know, be better understood, um, there is a lack of understanding of the mechanisms that contribute to Parkinson's disease um, pathogenesis, and that represents a challenge to develop more disease-modifying treatments, um, as most current therapies for Parkinson's are primarily targeted towards alleviating symptoms um, rather than trying to um, modify the disease processes. Um, therefore, there's a, a need to better understand these mechanisms of neuroinflammation so that we can better um, create those microbiome-targeted interventions. Um, so the study that I'm working on, um, we're looking to determine if motor manifest 
uh, par patients with Parkinson's um, have distinct intestinal microbiota um, compared to patients who have REM sleep behavioral disorder and patients who are considered to be um, healthy where they've undergone a sleep study, um, but it was inconclusive of REM sleep behavioral disorder. Um, and then characterize this microbiota community of motor manifest Parkinson's patients with those who have this REM sleep behavioral disorder in order to hopefully um, develop and identify therapeutic targets to design, you know, in future therapeutic trials, um, potential biomarker, biomarkers um, in those patients as well. Um, and just uh, basically it's a one-time visit. We want patients um, who have, again, PD, RBD, or both, and then patients who just essentially have some sort of sleep disorder, not necessarily REM sleep behavioral disorder, as well as a household control who of someone who lives in the same environment, you know, eats in the same environment, um, to really better understand um, what's going on in the brain and how is it connected, what the specific connections are, and so forth. Um, Oh, and that's just an explanation again. I can go into further detail because I do have my contact information listed here. Um, but if you are interested um, or just interested in hearing a little bit more um, about this uh, connection, uh, my information is listed here. Um, I know that was quick, but thank you for allowing me to talk a little bit about what we're doing with this in, um, in the department. And thank you for joining us. Thank you. And actually for our Russian Generations members, those of you that have offered our, your email address, you receive not only our quarterly newsletter in the mail, but you also receive our monthly email blasts or monthly e newsletters. You'll see additional information about this study in, in it and how to sign up. So, um, I think it was included even in the one that went out a few days ago uh, for the August one. So uh, be in the lookout for that. Um, so this is fantastic. Let me go through my notes because I have, I think a few more questions than we could have Dr. Agarwal as well joining us, um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to say before is that we may not like the idea of microorganisms or microbes in our body, uh, not only our gut, but also in our nose, uh, nose, mouth, and skin. They, we have those, but how important it is to have this diverse community in our gut. Um, and actually, Dr. Agarwal talked about that diversity, how important it is to have a diverse gut, uh, a diverse set of microbes as well. Um, as you heard here, it affects not only our digestion, but also it's quite important for our overall health. So um, Dr. Agarwal, you also mentioned um, something about the, the supplements and um, why is it that if there's no, not so much uh, information about them or how they how helpful they are. I imagine that it has to do also with the fact that um, the supplement market is unregulated. So if you could say a little bit more about that. Um, yeah, so I think uh, I'm not going to say anything about the supplement market. I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely like there's so much out there. Uh, and I uh, I would just say because having a nutrient from a supplement is very much different than having a nutrient from a food uh, in terms of the way it's been absorbed in the in our body and the, the metabolites it gets converted to. And uh, based on the scientific evidence we have so far from our studies, we didn't find any associations of the nutrients which were coming from supplements because we are also noting how many supplements they're consuming, but we did see an uh, association of the nutrients coming from uh, food directly. Mm -hmm. so, so definitely uh, the whole mechanism behind it is not well understood, but uh, the possibility is that def definitely there is something going on which uh, makes the nutrient coming from food a better version of that nutrient than just consuming it through a supplement. Uh, supplements are very important for people who are 
uh, deficient and do need supplement or not or not or are not able to eat properly right. or not consume the food which we are saying they should consume. Um, but then supplements shouldn't be a substitute for eating healthy if you can. Uh, Good point. That's what I would say. Good point. Um, and then uh, let me actually, I forgot to do this with our colors. We have a good number of colors as well. This is your time to press start six. If you would like to ask a question for the speakers. Let's see if somebody's trying. Star six for our speakers. Excuse me, for our callers, if they would like to ask a question. All right. Um, one question about the difference between pro, uh, probiotics and Prebiotics. I think we hear a lot about probiotics and um, prebiotics. Um, not that much. <laughs> um, I, I don't think that we hear a lot about that. But what would be the difference? Uh, should I, Stacy? Do you want to take this? One? Okay. So, uh, so, so the probiotic is the living organism in the food. So for example, the yogurts you're eating or kombucha or like the other things and like, um, so, so the organisms are already there and then you, you're consuming it, which helped your gut health. Mm -hmm. uh, the prebiotics are like the foods which uh, overall help your gut flora, the, the balance and everything. And it actually can, uh, includes like the fibers you're consuming, the bioactives in the foods, like overall, uh, the general food, the regular fruits and vegetables and the whole grains, you're consuming it, it has fiber in it, that will act as a prebiotic. It'll help your gut to maintain the gut health okay. uh, and help those organisms living in the gut to like have a, a, like not have a dysbiosis and like have a good balance and uh, okay. be diverse, et cetera. All right. So the prebiotics then foster the growth of those good probiotics. Yes, it helps okay. the gut health uh, overall. And then the pro is something which is a living organism in that food, which you consume, and then it helps your, like that organism goes to the gut. Um, thank you for that. And then there was a question about um, the yogurts. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, not all yogurts are good. And there's a lot of yogurts that also are high in sugar. So what yogurt will be good? So that's a good point. Um, always look at the label. So yogurt is good mm -hmm. overall because uh, people might use different cultures. For example, like the Greek yogurt culture is different than the regular mountain high or any other dan in which we're getting. So there, there can be variation in the culture used. But uh, it is very important that we look at the food label if you're buying it from outside. Um, like the food label shouldn't have a lot of added sugar in your yogurt. So it's, it's always better to have plain yogurt and then add some fruits and like probably granola because then you're having a whole grain and a fruit and then having just a kind of a combined meal, a parfait or something like that. I mean, that's what I would say, like rather than just going for the packaged high sugar yogurt on the shelves. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, try to read the labels. Um, I'm so glad you're saying that actually one of the uh, programs that we offer through Rush Generation's evidence-based programs is the uh, Take Charge of Your Health. You mm -hmm. know, it was originally developed at Stanford, the chronic disease self-management. And one of the things that we teach in some of the session is to how to read our labels. Yeah, that is very important. Mm -hmm. Actually, just great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's for the first time that then people go into the supermarket and start looking at. Yeah. Um, especially when you see that number, then also the number of serving. Yes, yeah. and then also the percentage. The percentage. Like, percentage. percentage. Mm -hmm. So how much like the sodium of like anything less than seven is good. 
or like total sugar, how much percent of total sugar is there? Mm -hmm. so like that. So it is important to read your labels. All right. Um, well, I don't see uh, any other questions in the YouTube channel or on my phone. So I greatly appreciate the conversation. I'm so delighted that this is going to be recorded for people to reference back. Um, great information there. So um, I am going to then give one more chance to a caller. It seems that we are not having anyone star six unmuting. Going once, it's going twice. <laughs> um, let's see if Hannah has anybody, but I don't think so. I think that we are okay. So what we will do, thank you so much again. We greatly appreciate taking time um, of your very busy days to join us and offer this key information to our Rush Generations members. Um, we hope to see you again. And uh, we have great collaborations with the Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center. So I'm sure that our Rush Generations members are always used to seeing here and there information about some of the pro wonderful program that you're doing. And, I'm delighted now to have this connection with Stacy and Dr. Hall. So thank you so much for joining us. I think that we can then transition into having the, um, the information about upcoming programs. I'm trying to put that up. Hi, Hannah. I thought that I had it ready in queue, but I think, let's see, da, da, da. all right. Excellent. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Hannah. Yes, I couldn't see it. So thank you so much. Um, before we talk about the next lecture that we're going to have, let me introduce you to some of the programs that we're going to, we are offering through Rush Generations. This is one of the evidence-based programs that I was just referencing, um, the one in which you also get to learn about how to read, you know, your food labels so that you're absolutely eating healthy. Um, but this is a weird six week workshop for people that have chronic conditions or going health conditions. Um, in, and over the course of these six weeks, some of the topics that we discuss include goal setting, nutrition, physical activity, main medication management, pain management, effective communication, and strategies for working with healthcare professionals. All of these skills are skills necessary to improve people's confidence in managing their chronic health conditions. And as a result, then living a more active life. We have one coming up pretty soon, August 22nd. Those six weeks run, go by very quickly. So if you or someone you know ha, is dealing with a chronic health condition, please give us a call. This one is going to be virtually and you can register at 1-800-757-0202. Um, we also have from the same ty uh, type of workshop, evidence-based learning to live well with chronic pain is another of those six week workshops. And this one is specifically for people with chronic pain. Um, participants engage in discussions and skill building activities to better cope with the day-to-day -day management of chronic pain. All the sessions incorporate an exercise element and strategies uh, for medication management, pacing and resting, and uh, many other skills necessary so that you don't suffer that much from, from your chronic pain. But this one will start it, uh, even a week earlier. So pretty soon, next week, August 15th, is gonna be the first day until September 26th. 
also virtual. So if you're interested in this one, please give us a call at 1-800-757-0202. Then we have the Health Legacy Program for Women. And actually this program was developed here at Rush. It's a free six week workshop designed for women of color who are seeking to learn to eat right, to lose weight, to learn how to better manage their health and who want to create a plan that improves the health and well-being of their family, therefore leaving a health legacy for their family. Throughout the six weeks, um, it meets twice, so it's 12 sessions. Participants learn about nutrition, healthy eating, coping skills to deal with the lifestyle changes they like to make. They exercise at the end of, this, of each session. It's a very rewarding program. So don't postpone improving your health and the health of your loved ones. Call our toll-free number 1-800-757-0202 and we'll connect you with the Health Legacy Program staff. Embracing Aging, this is one of our fitness classes. This class was designed to improve muscle strength, range of movement, balance, and activities for daily living. For those with any issues with balance or concerns about falling, um, they can use a chair for support when doing the standing exercises. There's also a good number of seated exercises in this class. Um, so the instructors offer exercise uh, modifications as well. This one is gonna start next week on Mondays until October 9th in the afternoon, also virtual. It's eight sessions for a total of $40. Um, however, if you know, those $40 right now with everything being so expensive, if that's a challenge for you, just let us know. We have scholarships. We don't want that to get in the way of your fitness and your health. So just call us again for to 1-800-757-0202. Oh, we have this fabulous um, program that is with our friends at Terranova Films. They actually create many different films, um, including those that we use for our Matter of Balance workshops. And they have a new film that is for caregivers. And we are very delighted to be partnering with them for this in-person, in-person event. Very intimate. It's a limited number of spots. So call today 1-800-757-0202 because we would like to have you. Um, if you're an older adult or a caregiver of an older adult um, or a caregiver, just please consider joining us. We are going to validate the parking. We want to make it very easy for you to take part of this fabulous and unique program that we're gonna have on August 25th here at Rush. Again, to register 1-800-757-0202. We continue to have our diabetes education and support group. Um, we are offering this still virtually, it's easier for people that way still. So if you would like to be part of, um, be part of this support group, um, feel free to call us at 1-800-757-0202. It means once a month. Then another support group that we have is the one for friends and family of people with memory loss support group. If you are or someone you know is helping a person with memory loss, Alzheimer's disease or other types of dementia, this is a great group that meets once a month to share information, resources, ideas, and to talk about the ups and downs of caregiving. It's a group facilitated by two of our talented licensed clinical social workers. Um, the group is in an informal, diverse group, and it welcomes new members every month. So it meets the second month day of every month in the evening, so that usually caregivers are also helping or, or, or working or need to have somebody watch over that person while they at, attend the group. So call us at the 1-800-757-0202 so that we can give you more information about the conference call. How is it that you can join? 
Um, and sometimes recently they have also been joining, doing in-person and virtual. So give us a call and we will give you the latest on this group. The Senior Connections Friendly Color Program, we are still offering this wonderful program that connects socially isolated or lonely older adults with a trained volunteer for weekly calls. The calls are designed to be person-centered. Um, it's a person-centered discussion, meaning that volunteers are calling to establish a friendship and genuine connection. So there's no structured questions, no interventions. This is a friendly call. So if you would like to receive this weekly call, call us at 1-800-757-0202 and we will connect you with that, the staff of that program. Um, Rush Caring for Caregivers, that program aims to support family or friends who are providing care for adults age 60 and older. This program focuses on what matters most to each caregiver involved in it. It's an intervention that is offered by licensed clinical social workers, and they assist caregivers with creating personalized plans that take into account their health, their well-being, uh, and that incorporates the needs of the older adult getting that care from their caregiver. For more information, you can call the 312-563-0350. That's a different number, 312-563-0350. However, if you still call our, our toll-free number, we'll make sure that you get connected with that group. The services are offered by phone, in person, online, so if you're caring or know of someone caring for someone who is 60 or older, just give them a call or give us a call and we will connect you with them. So Rush Older Adult Home Modification Program is designed for older adults to work with community and health professionals so that they can learn how to gain additional support with the goals of continuing to live at home safely. The program includes a work with uh, work with a nurse, an occupational therapist, and home repair specialty as well to get the personalized home evaluation with recommendations. Um, they it involves also having professional installation of modifications that you choose to add to your home. Um, it builds your confidence by working with professionals, and the services are free to consumers to consumers who are eligible for this program. So um, the costs are covered by a generous grant from the US Housing and Urban Development Department. And the number again is different this time, 312-942-6400. But if you don't remember that name, that number, feel free to call our toll free number. Our dear colleagues will make sure that you're connected to them. And then lastly, but not least, uh, Shulman Senior Voices. Uh, we aim to empower older adults to discuss what matters most to them as they age. It is important to share what matters most to you with your physician, with your loved ones. So Shulman Senior, Voice, uh, Shulman Senior Voices, if you go into that um, website, the bit.ly, record my story, or if you scan that QR code. You can share your wisdom on why it is important for your healthcare team and your loved ones to know your goals, your wishes. You always, when you record a video, you also get a copy of that video via your email address. So consider letting us know also why this topic that was discussed today was very important to you. And our next lecture is going to be two weeks from today. We are going to be discussing mental health and aging. So we hope to see you then. Um, and as always, I, uh, we are always delighted to have you. Uh, feel free to give us a call if you would like to consult in terms of any of our Rush Generations programs but also if you would like to be connected with uh, one of our licensed or licensed clinical social workers, the number again, 
757-0202. Thank you so much for having joined us today.